If you're watching this video, you are likely already a Fallout fan. You've seen the trailer for the new show coming out on Amazon in April 2024, had your own thoughts about it, and then popped over onto another video to hear what you should think about the show. To begin, you shouldn't really be made to think anything from me or any other content creator. All we've had to go off so far is a trailer, some still frame shots, and descriptions of the characters and events found online. Every single point I mentioned in this video might be fundamentally incorrect or changed upon the show's release. However, we do know the location, the protagonist, and the setting. The story will be set in post-war Los Angeles in the year of 2296, approximately 219 years after the Great War. Ella Purnell will star as Lucy, a vault dweller thrust out into the world above to solve issues within their vault. Now where does that sound familiar? Una travels throughout the wasteland to interact with other introduced characters, such as Walter Goggins as the Ghoul, or Aaron Moten as a Brotherhood of Steel Squire. But if the information I've seen so far for it is correct, then it's probably safe to say that the TV show is not made for us. This isn't to be a staunch pessimist. It might have fun moments, great visuals, and draw us in more than we might have thought. But if you're watching this video already being a Fallout fan, we are not the target audience for it. Now, to fully understand this, first we must enter the mind of an Amazon executive. Set the scene. You're on the 31st floor of an LA skyscraper. The bright sun enters the wall-length window, but the presence of God does not. You've been given the IP of the Fallout series to make a television adaption, and you're pondering on how to ensure the show has the biggest reach. You search up Fallout on the internet, on YouTube, and see a plethora of channels dedicated to this series and think to yourself, God, there's an awful lot of dweebs out there who love this show. They'll definitely watch it. But then a bright idea goes off in your head. You don't need to market it to them. Heck, you don't even need to cater to them. They'll watch it no matter what. Who you should market and design it for are people who don't know what Fallout is. Market it for the couple looking for a new show to watch on Tuesday night since their therapist told them to do more together. The college students in their share house who cycle through every new show on Amazon, Netflix, Disney, whatever streaming service they have or the family wanting to switch on something to placate their kids and give them an hour of peace and quiet. Don't market it towards the dweebs. Market it towards the normies. I'm being a little bit rude about this, but I do understand why they would do so. Friends of mine or family members who know that I do these YouTube vids have said, oh cool, Amazon's making a Fallout show, I'll have to watch it so I understand your videos more. We, as the core fan base, are going to watch it. Amazon knows that and we know that. They don't need to entice us to watch it, and even if it doesn't live up to our expectations, most of us will still watch it. And as such, the formula that I've seen for the show so far does feel somewhat formulaic for me, but it's the best way to introduce the series to new members of the franchise. Fallout 3 was my first introduction to the games, and was the first Bethesda Fallout product. In order to soft launch us into the series, they started somewhere familiar. In a vault, as a vault dweller, forced their head into the wasteland. And this works twofold for the TV show. One, for a prior fan of the series, we can understand the setup and are familiar with the direction. But two, for a new viewer, it's the best vehicle to introduce them to the story. Much like an innocent vault dweller, they too are in a sheltered, luxury world and know nothing of the horrors of the wasteland. Having said vault dweller naively traverse the world above is the perfect vehicle for new viewers to do the same. Much like Lucy, they'll be going into the unknown. Again, it's understandable for a fan of the show already, but not a setup that makes me immediately excited. And this might be an unfair comparison, but it can be compared maybe to the Rings of Power. Lord of the Rings fans absolutely hated the Rings of Power, and honestly that's fair enough. I love Lord of the Rings, but I didn't even finish that show because it disappointed me so much. But many casual viewers, which outnumbered genuine die-hard fans of the series, did enjoy it and watched it in huge numbers, and it now has a second season coming. And so is the hope for Amazon for Fallout. The real fans of the series are not the ones they want to get their hooks into, it's the just normal casual fans. And I would say this isn't necessarily a bad thing. I am 28 years old and first got into Fallout when my brother bought Fallout 3 for me back in 2008. I fell in love with the series and I've played it ever since. The OGs out there started playing Fallout 1 and 2 in the 90s. Fallout 4 came out in 2015 and while it had its heights, it definitely had its lows, and Fallout 76 came out in 2018, which honestly represented all that I hate in modern game culture. I might be biased, but in my mind, the last proper Fallout game came out in 2015, nearly a decade ago, which means there's a whole new generation of gamers out there who might never pick up the Fallout series, because there are arguably more recent titles for them to enjoy. Having this series honestly might give the Fallout franchise the jumpstart that it needs, exposing it to a whole new bunch of fans who might enjoy the show, purchase the game, and become brand new converts. 
This in turn could spark more interest in Bethesda to actually make a new Fallout game, one in a more recent time frame, and one that is actually good. However, to abruptly cut short any sense of positivity I was talking about, we need to refer back to the previous point I was making, between the Rings of Power and Fallout. The difference in comparing these two is that the producers did state outright that while Tolkien's estate was consulted, the Rings of Power is not considered a prequel or part of the canon Lord of the Rings universe itself. It's merely an adaption. However, this is not the case for the Fallout TV show. In an interview, Todd Howard had stated that, We view what's happening in the show as canon. We did not want to do an interpretation of an existing story. A lot of pictures were, you know, this is the movie of Fallout 3. And I was like, yeah, we told that story. I don't have a lot of interest seeing those translated. I was interested in someone telling a unique Fallout story. Treat it like a game. It gives the creators of the series their own playground to play in. And that's what's great, when someone else looks at your work and then translates it in some fashion. Basically, from this statement, whatever happens in this show is part of the universe. And this is where I have the problem. You can make the show be a dumbed down version. Hell, you basically have to. The average viewer is not going to care about all the intricate details of the Fallout universe. They don't have time to. But you could get around that by just making the show a non-canon part of the series. Making an adaption. But this is not the case for the Fallout TV show. The show's creators have stated publicly that in terms of continuity, the Fallout show is functionally Fallout 5. Anything that happens within the realms of this series is canonically as much part of the franchise as any other entry. And that honestly wouldn't worry me too much if it wasn't taking place in a core region experienced in the first two games, Fallout 1 and 2, as well as directly influencing the post-game events of Fallout New Vegas. Executive producer Graham Wagner had stated, We didn't start from a place of characters from the games. We set things after. We kind of told ourselves, this is Fallout 5, this is just another installation, and we're starting with fresh snow. But if you really wanted to tell a brand new story, set it in New York, set it in Chicago, Miami, New Orleans, go somewhere never tread before. Because having the series set in Los Angeles raises a lot of questions. The main one is, where the hell is the NCR? The Fallout TV series is set in Los Angeles in the year 2296, only 14 years after Fallout New Vegas. The NCR is an absolute powerhouse of a faction, a democratic post-war society encompassing the whole of the former state of California and more. It had enough power, resources and population to field armies in regions hundreds of kilometres away, such as New Vegas. It was a society numbering in the literal millions that had begun to provide its people a life akin to those experienced in pre-war times. Los Angeles, or the Boneyard as it was known as, was one of the largest cities in the NCR. It hosted the followers Boneyard Medical University, as well as the NCR's gold reserves and money printers. At just an extremely base level, in-game dialogue states that it was a stable location, with rebuilt and renovated buildings, a thriving population, and food, electricity, and water in abundance. Vault 33, the home of our protagonist Lucy, is located in Santa Monica, literally the heart of the Boneyard. And from what we see, the outside landscape is a desolate, barren wasteland akin to most other regions in the waste. The issue is that this is in a location that 14 years ago was declared as being so safe and rebuilt that NCR citizens would travel to frontier regions like the Mojave Wasteland since there was nothing left to scavenge. And Vault 33 evidently know of the NCR. Images taken from the set show that an NCR flag is within what appears to be a Vault schoolroom. So the NCR evidently has experienced some form of decline, whether it's just the state of Boneyard that has returned to the waste, or perhaps the entire nation that has fallen to dust. The fact that the Brotherhood of Steel are able to project their power across to California leads credence to this. The NCR fought the Brotherhood to a standstill, all the way to the point that these power-clad wearing super soldiers had to hide in bunkers away from the NCR. If the Brotherhood are able to not only fly unchallenged in vertebrates, but build an airship named the Caswinen that is on par with the East Coast Brotherhood's Pridwin, then the NCR must barely be a factor now. I'm open to being surprised, but it honestly would need to be an amazing explanation on how a nation of a million people faded into nothingness. When I was originally looking into this, I thought that maybe it's a result of one of the new Vegas endings being canonized. Perhaps Mr. House or an independent Vegas Raiden Supreme had led to the NCR swift decline in the face of the lives, money, and energy spent in the campaign for nothing. Perhaps Caesar's Legion were successful and ground the NCR into dust. Or maybe even the NCR won, but the overexertion in forming a sixth state led to the destruction of the nation. Maybe, but also very unlikely. I'm personally devastated if the NCR has gone the way of the Dodo. 
I know that might seem like a surprise, but I think it's important to show a post-war society that is able to survive in the waste with a focus on returning to civilization. For one, it creates a good juxtaposition to the brutal and raider tribal societies out in the waste, but it also does make sense. If 200 years have passed, humanity would either die out or begin to adapt and survive in the post-war world. That being said, if they can provide a valid reasoning for it, I'll be on board with it. But it needs to be a pretty damn good reason. It can't be some kind of, somehow Palpatine return type of explanation. If you're making this show be canon to the in-game universe, then it needs to make sense. Otherwise you can be damn sure none of us will probably purchase another Fallout game again. This last point that I'll make for the TV show, likely not being designed for fans of the Fallout series, is potentially nitpicky, but it has to do with one of the identified lead characters, the ghoul played by Walton Goggins. In show, the ghoul is a mysterious gun-toting rebel with a sense of honour who will seemingly go bang bang with his gun. A man who has survived for centuries on his skill and wit in his ghoulified form. I was pumped as hell that a ghoul was going to be a main character, and I still am. But the issue is he's been Hollywooded up, even when he's meant to be playing a necrotic post-human. He looks too damn good. He's got pearly whites, his skin is even in coloration, and his eyes have regular pupils. Nolan did outright explain this, however, stating that, There's a practical reason to make him less ghoulish. You have to be extremely careful with it when you're putting a full appliance on someone's face. Their face is their instrument, and I need to be able to see Walton and his performance. He needs to look like a ghoul from the game, and he needs to be kind of hot. Now, there are many changes between ghouls in their multitude of Fallout games, of their physiology, their look, and even the process of ghoulification itself. But the one consensus is, they have been goddamn ugly. So ugly that even after 200 years of existence, many settlements won't even have them in their settlements. They live as second class citizens, purely on how they look. It's only in the rare shining bastions of civilization like the NCR, where legislation is signed to protect them. For most others, they're disgusted with them, and groups like the Brotherhood of Steel shoot them on sight. Anyway, I digress, but keeping with the law, ghouls should look like the Walking Dead, rather than Red Skull. They should look so goddamn hideous that even if the nicest ghoul on the planet talked to you, you couldn't tolerate their presence for more than a day. And that's half the issue. That works for us as the gamers. We can either emphasise with their challenges, or hate them, depending on what faction we choose. A newcomer to the Fallout series is going to be too much like a regular wastelander if they went with the standard ghoul. They'd be repulsed. They couldn't root for the character. They wouldn't want to watch the series. They wouldn't want to see the plotline advance, or see more of that character themselves. They'd just switch off and choose another show to watch. And it's not like the actor Walton Goggins hasn't played a similar character. In the Maze Runner movies, he plays a character named Lawrence, who does legitimately look like what a fuller ghoul is supposed to look like, and he looks like shit. It's truly difficult to look upon. But basically, the studio went with a relatively good-looking Hancock-esque ghoul rather than the Walking Dead prototype that is usually seen. Purely because the average viewer is not conditioned to root for the zombie, no matter how much of a normal person they actually are. Amazon needed the ghoul to be a presentable character in order to keep people watching. Anyway, if you made it this far, please don't take these ramblings as the dejected whinging of an adult man-child. I hope I am wrong. I hope that even though the new TV show is going to be a canon entry to the series, and appears to be changing a lot of established norms of the setting, that it will be great. We can only win if the series is one that is loved by both newcomers to the franchise and fans of old. But I unfortunately think that in their bid to win newcomers to the series, the showrunners may have potentially taken a deathclaw-sized crap on something that we all love.